Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo with Bo O today. Super glad to be with you on March 14th, 2020. What are we at? 2023? God, I gotta check my calendar. That's when you know you're getting a little aged, right? When you're like, wait, time out. Wasn't it just 2022 like the other day? <laughs> it was. And we're already in March, mid March, right about that mid March area. Um, wow. You know, you think of that and you already go quarter taxes right around the corner. Oh, my. Um, that's right. So, man, gosh, things are just flying by. But it's a beautiful day in the desert. We're going to be in First Kings chapter 22 today on the Morning Devo with Bo O. Bo Ouellette is my name. Ouellette, O-U-E-L-L-E-T-T-E, -E -E, French Canadian name. Hockey is full steam ahead. Playoffs right around the corner. Um, excited, praying for uh, our team here in the desert to uh, to um, pull it through and get in those playoffs. Um, so hoping for that. And um, still ski season all over the place. So, um, God, still some skiing maybe to be done this year as well. So that'll be great. Uh, if I can get on the slopes once again, that would be fun. So anyway, King Ahab. Government, prophet, spokesperson for God. And that's really the, the, the theme of this part of the Bible. The narrative is that there is a disconnect um, between, in general, people and God in the deity. God makes a way for people to draw close to them. That's what the term sacrifice means. Offering means to draw close. Sacrifice to make holy. And to make separate for God, um, usable, um, sin has to be dealt with. And uh, so we get this really intense picture in the Bible that God is righteous and, and he has a righteousness that cannot be compromised. So God can't grade on the curve. And this has been the theme of the scriptures so far. But now we get into this government prophet relationship. Ahab is a guy who's really sent the northern tribes of Israel. Remember, there's 12 tribes. He sent the northern part, the really 10 tribes, into severe idolatry. Instead of bringing people to the place of Jerusalem, where God was to make a name for himself in the temple, in the temple uh, that was built by Solomon, um, David's son through Bathsheba of all people. And uh, they instead, Ahab, what he did is he set up different, in a sense, temples to be uh, to, for people to go there instead. So he's basically just doing what he wants to do. And um, isn't that the way we are as human beings? We want our autonomy. We want to do what we want to do. And uh, there's, some, there's some debate on how much autonomy we actually want, but we certainly want a measure of it and, um, or think we have a measure of it going on. And, um, and certainly Ahab provides for them a place to, in a sense, be lazy, not travel to Jerusalem. Hey, I can just kind of go locally down the road. You know, I don't got to go to that church over there, you know, where I have to, you know, maybe that's where, you know, I mean, I'll be in with them for years and blah, 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 whatever. I've been going there, but now, you know, it's much more convenient to go two miles away. And, um, you know, sometimes you get that kind of attitude for sure. And, uh, it nowadays, right with us. Um, but back then you needed to get to Jerusalem and, uh, they had feasts that they were a part of. And anyway, it says for three years, there was no war between Aram and Israel. So for three years, they have some peace. Then during the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah went to visit King Ahab of Israel. So you have two kings in Israel, southern, northern. They're going to hang out. 
And it says, During the visit, the king of Israel said to his officials, Do you realize that the town of Ramoth Gilead belongs to us? And yet we've done nothing to recapture it from the king of Aram. Then he turned to Jehoshaphat and asked, Will you join me in the battle to recover Ramoth Gilead? Interesting. So you see, for three years, already other people, other nations, Um, are already in the land, you know, and have an anchor down, so to speak, right? Um, You know, things just consistently, um, if you will, um, continue, meaning Israel was supposed to drive out the other nations of the land, but they never did. And all through their battles, you know, it's happening because they never really drove out those things. And that's a lot like our life. Sometimes we just don't drive out the things that need to be driven out. And we let them linger. And you know what that's like. It says, Then he turned to Jehoshaphat and asked, Will you join me in battle? And Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, Why, of course, you and I are as one. My troops are your troops, and my horses are your horses. Then Jehoshaphat added, But first... Let's find out what the Lord says. Hmm, what a good idea. Hey, let's go here. Let's go there. Let's do this. Let's do that. But what does the Lord say? You know, I bet you a lot of people, I know me too, praying, you know, about, hey, you know, the money that I put into that thing called the Roth IRA, is that thing even going to be there? <laughs> you know, after the latest news on the California bank? You know, sometimes you have to just seek the Lord, right? And just you're praying, God, give me an understanding, you know, of what I need to do. And uh, that's what they do. So the king of Israel summoned the prophets, about 400 of them, 400 prophets. Remember Elijah said, hey, you know, I thought I was the only one. Remember he kind of complained about that? 400 prophets. Wow. And asked them, should I go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should I hold back? And they all replied, yes, go right ahead. The Lord will give you king, uh, the king victory. So it's neat to see that God has a bunch of prophets, right? Not just one, but a bunch of people. And that's neat. Sometimes we can get so fixated on one person, you know, in the ministry, in kind of the church environment that it's like, we got to listen to everything they did. And man, did you hear that YouTube they did? And they did a YouTube and that one's so deep. Everybody else isn't deep, but this person's deep, you know? And you kind of wonder like, really? Like everybody like isn't as good as this person? Like, you know, sometimes we get so fixated on a person. And in the New Testament, the Bible says that the writer of the New Testament, most of the New Testament a guy we call Paul the Apostle, right? He says, who am I? What am I? You know, are we not all just ministers of Christ? You know, one waters, one, you know, does this, one scatters the seed. I, uh, you know, don't let any of you guys say I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos or I'm of Cephas. You know, don't say I'm of Paul. Paul said, man, don't be, you know, just into my YouTube clips and like, you know, just you're into me so much that you're not into, you know, you don't understand that it's Jesus's work in us. It's his Holy Spirit that does anything good. Paul says, nothing good in my flesh dwells. Please do not focus on the messenger, you know, focus on the message and and whose message it really is and it should be jesus's message right yeah and so 400 prophets that's cool that's a large number that's a lot of people and it says uh, they they replied back go ahead right you're going to have the victory but jehoshaphat asked is there also a prophet of the lord here we should ask him the same question okay so they go to the 400 prophets of the north But Jehoshaphat seems a little skeptical. The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, There is no one more, there is one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. (laughs) He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is um, Micaiah, son of Emiah. Jehoshaphat replied, that's not the way a king should talk. Let's hear what he has to say. Hmm. 
So, you know, 400 prophets uh, are available, and the king of the north maybe knows them all. I don't know. Maybe he's scared them all. So that even though there's a ton of people around the government, no one really wants to say anything that would shake up things, so to speak, right? You know, you can lose your job kind of stuff. Maybe that's what's going on. We'll see. But they call on this Micaiah, who is hated by the Ahab. And Jehoshaphat replied, um, hey, man, you don't talk too well about him. That's not really cool for a king to do that. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, quick, bring Micaiah, son of Amiah. And I kind of like this, too, is that I love it that Jehoshaphat says to the other king, to Ahab, hey, he kind of rebukes him, right? He, you know, to correct him. He says, hey, you know what, man? You shouldn't really chat like that about that person. And I kind of like that, you know? Hmm. You know, I know it's neat when, you know, my wife says to me things like, you know, it's the, you know, the way you talk, the way, you know, it could be the way you do this or the way you do that. And it makes me think like, you know, gosh, yeah, I have to be more aware of, you know, the way I am. And you get into these little weird ruts in your, the way you talk or the way you look at people or whatever it is, your exaggerations and your you know, things like that, whatever, you know, your temperance, you know, and not really temperance, but it's just uh, kind of the way you carry yourself. And, and sometimes that can be something that, um, you know, we don't, we don't use very well. We don't do it very well. You know, we, we kind of offend people instead of build them up and that's not good. And it's, I know those are tough talks, and they're not the easiest to hear, you know, but we need to hear them. You know, correction is important and, you know, we all need to be corrected for sure. And it doesn't mean the person's against us who's correcting us. We have to realize that, you know, if you think everybody's against you that corrects you and rebukes you, well, then you've put yourself in a position never to be corrected or rebuked. You will always kind of take the path of least resistance, uh, which might not be the best path for just growth as humans and and the humility that's required, right, in our life to produce good fruit. And so, you know, being in a position where we can be rebuked is a good thing. And uh, that's what the king does to the other king. And so King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah, dressed in their royal robes, were sitting on the thrones at the threshing floor near the gates of Samaria. That's the capital of the northern kingdoms. And all Ahab's prophets were prophesying there in front of him. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Kenea, made some iron horns and proclaimed, This is what the Lord says, With these horns you will gore the Arameans to death. All the, peop- all the other prophets agreed. Yes, they said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead. You will be victorious, for the Lord will be um, uh, the king victory. Now, the Lord will give you the king, uh, king, give the king victory. So, you know, they're, they're really making a, a big de- to do out of this, right? Before the kings. I mean, this is a, sounds like a pretty serious government situation. You're going to do it. You're going to go very pep talky, you know, TV's on, everything's looking good. Everybody's dressed nice. Everybody smells good. And they and the prophets are there definitely puffing up the decision to go, everything like that. Meanwhile, the messengers who went to get Micaiah said to him, look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king. Be sure that you agree with them and uh, promise success. Hmm. Ooh, very interesting. People of power telling other people, right, what to do so that nothing gets, nothing gets ruffled. Doesn't that sound interesting? People in power going to other people that aren't in power and telling them what to do, right? Telling them how to act as to what? not upset the hegemonical power structure. Interesting, right? Wow. Again, very stuff goes on all the time. And it says, but Micaiah replied, as surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what the Lord tells me to say. Hmm, I'm only going to tell the truth. Wow. What a cool, 
man of integrity here, right? I mean, don't you want to be a person of integrity? Gosh, man, Lord, is my yes, yes, is my no, no. When Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should we hold back? So this is what Ahab asks. Ahab doesn't like him. Micaiah replied sarcastically, yes, go up and be victorious for the Lord will give you the king victory. Hmm, go do it. Oh, yeah, go, go, go for it. He says it sarcastically. Wow. So is there a place for sarcastic remarks? Sounds like it, right? Nothing's wrong with sarcasm. It's just a style, if you will. But we have to be careful about our sar sarcasm, right? It's got to be done in the right spots, right? And here, definitely, Micaiah picks the right spot before Ahab. And he says, oh, yeah, go. But the king replied sharply, how many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak for the Lord? So Ahab knows, right, that uh, Micaiah is pulling his leg. Then Micaiah told him in a vision, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. Wow. Jesus picks up on this, no doubt, when he's talking and he sees Israel as sheep without a shepherd. He sees them still without a king, still without a leader in his day. Isn't that amazing? You know, you have, you know, eight, nine hundred years before Christ, you have Ahab, who's, you know, here before Micaiah the prophet. Micaiah says this wonderful statement that it, or it's, a, it's a profound statement. Let me say it that way that Israel is like a sheep without a shepherd. And our Lord Jesus, man, even when he came on the scene, he saw them still as a sheep without a shepherd, right? Not someone who truly cares for them. Hey, aren't you glad Jesus truly cares for you? He is the good shepherd, the Bible says. It talks about the good shepherd in the book of Ezekiel. Jesus picks up on that and talks about it in uh, his life that he is the fulfillment of the good shepherd of Ezekiel, of the book of Ezekiel. And, um, and this is what uh, Micaiah saw that Israel needed, was that good shepherd, that one to really take care of the flock, someone to really care for you, someone who's going to really be there for you. Who's going to be there when you go to die? Who is going to help you through that process? Who is going to give you the hope and the peace and the confidence and the evidence that there is eternal life, an eternal life with the Creator. Man, I only know of one, and that's Jesus. How do we know that? He rose from the dead. Has anybody else done that? That's the big question. We have a good shepherd. So Micaiah continued, um, and he says, Didn't I tell you? The king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, he never prophesies anything, but troubles me. Then Micaiah continued, listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the armies of heaven around him and on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who can entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so he can be killed? There were many suggestions and finally a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. How will you do this? The Lord asked, and the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all of Ahab's prophets, prophets to speak lies. Wow. A spiritual connection to all the 400 prophets of Ahab who were speaking, right? Man, what a trip, right? A spiritual backdrop is given to us. Something happened in something happening in a spiritual realm that affects the physical world. Wow. Very, uh, very interesting insight. And I love those insights from the Bible, man. They are phenomenal. And uh, they will say, you will succeed, said the Lord. Go ahead. Or you will succeed, said the Lord. Go out and do it. Yeah, go out and do it. They have been given over. They, they, Their hearts are hard. So you see, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all your prophets, for the Lord has announced your doom. Remember, this is something that has been prophesied about at Ahab, not something that we should be shocked by. Ahab sh sh certainly shouldn't be shocked by this. Because God's already told them that, guess what? Judgment is right there for you. It's right there at your door, 
Then Zedekiah and Canaanah walked up to Micaiah and slapped him across the face. Hmm. Hey, hey, that happened recently, wasn't it at some award show? Someone came up and smacked someone? Anyway, yeah, slapped him in the face. Since when did the Spirit of the Lord leave me to speak to you, he demanded. Wow. Brawling about the Spirit of God. Hey, the Spirit of God is in me. No, the Spirit of God is in you. And they're fighting over this. Wow. Well, one is anyway. Micaiah replies, you will find out soon enough when you are trying to hide in some secret room. You're going to find out soon enough who's really being moved by the Spirit of God. See, God has already revealed to Ahab already that judgment was happening. Ahab is believing lying if you will, uh, 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 that lying prophet that says, oh no, everything's great, everything's great. But it's already been told to Ahab that it's not all good. But Ahab strongly wants to believe that everything's good. So he believes in the lie. Instead of just looking humbly and just going, you know what? God's already told me I'm going to be judged. God's already told me my family's going to be judged. My wife's going to be judged. You know what? Maybe things ain't all good. Maybe we ain't going to win this battle. Maybe Micaiah's right. Maybe I need to be patient here and just take a step back. Because God's already revealed things that would make me totally think that Micaiah is telling the truth. See, we got we to gotta rely on what God has already revealed today. You know, what has God already said you know, what has God already laid out in his word? You know, when people go, oh, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be great. Well, the Bible says something different. <laughs> you know, it says we're going to be deceived, right? And that there's going to be a deception. People aren't going to see it. They're going to be blinded to it. And I need to know, I need to, I need to be aware of that, you know. So there's already things that have been revealed to us too, you know. Hmm. Laura Walker says there are times in our lives that we need to prune out the areas where we are sinning due to pride. Even the smallest sins can prevent growth in Christian life. Yeah, so true, right? Hmm. I find that in my own life as well. A continual pruning of the Lord. So let's see. Um, arrest him. The king ordered uh, uh, to arrest Micaiah. Take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city. And to my son, Joash, give them this order from the king to put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. But Micaiah replied, if you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those standing around, everyone mark my words. Wow. Hey, there you go. Hey, if you come back, then I'm not telling the truth. And so what happens? The king of Ahab. And so we will finish this book tomorrow. We will do a part B because it goes into some of that. And, um, and you know, we'll want to just finish the book strong, right? Not in a rush. So, hey, 1 Kings chapter 22. We got one more day. Or, uh, we got one more day to finish it up. And then we're done with the book already. Done with another book of the Bible. Isn't that great? And a great devotion, man. Really good to think about Ahab's life. Think about the power structures, right? How manipulation happens. Some of that you see there again, right? But then you see the honesty of Micaiah, which is, man, so true. Just that, that, that sometimes we need just the right rebuke, right? We need the right correction. And, uh, and it's okay. I gotta, in my heart, I gotta be able to take correction and take the rebukes that are needed. Mm, yes. And it's okay. You know, um, it doesn't mean I'm not valued. It doesn't mean you're not loved. It doesn't mean any of those things. It means you are loved. And that's why we're being corrected and pruned as Laura talks about. So in the comments. So thanks for the comment corner for sure. That always helps a lot too in the devos just brings out some cool stuff. So you guys have a great day and, uh, you know, tomorrow, Lord willing, right? Bye-bye.